and hello to everybody as you filter into uh, the second site conversation for September 23rd. Hi, everybody. Hi to all. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started uh, today. Um, I'm going to begin uh, with a reminder to go ahead and mute yourself if you're not um, actively speaking, which should only happen during the Q&A, or if your name is Ann Vetter or Krista Spelbonis, um, or Lisa Hostetler for that matter. Uh, so if everybody could mute themselves, that would be helpful. You're welcome to keep your video on if you prefer to see who else is in the audience, that's fine. Um, this is the uh, second iteration of our series highlighting the Second Sight Award nominees. Um, this is the September 23rd edition, and today we are featuring the work of two artists who participated um, in the 2021 Medium Review. Uh, they are Krista Spalbonis and Ann Vetter. Um, we're recording this presentation today and we'll upload it to our website soon. If you missed the first of our conversations with uh, three artists, Stacey Merfar, Nahatan Navarro, and Alex Turner, this was moderated by Ann Kelly of Photo Eye Gallery in Santa Fe. I encourage you to visit our website uh, to see the recording and discover their work. It was a great conversation um, from three really interesting artists. Uh, and also, if you're planning um, or interested to attend the next Medium Review, which happens in February of 2022, this is planned as an in-person event. Um, we'll go ahead and provide a link to that in the chat and or you can follow on social media and you'll see plenty of reminders. Um, I want to thank uh, Kevin Miller, who's going to be monitoring our chat today and assisting with Q&As. Uh, Kevin served as the chief curator at the Southeast Museum of Photography for 20 or some odd years um, for quite some time. And I also uh, wanted to acknowledge that today we are originating this broadcast from the unceded lands of the Kumeyaay people who are the original inhabitants of the San Diego and Tijuana region and who continue to contribute their culture, their stories and their art for the greater good. So I wanna thank the Kumeyaay people for sharing your home um, with all of us. Uh, today's program will be led by uh, short presentations from each of the two artists, followed by conversation and questions with Lisa Hostetler. Lisa is a curator and art historian who specializes in photography and contemporary art. Um, for seven years prior uh, to April of 2021, she served as the curator in charge of the Department of Photography at the George Eastman Museum and has held previous positions as the McAvoy Family Curator of Photography at the Smithsonian American Art Museum and as Curator of Photographs at the Milwaukee Art Museum. Um, and I should also remind you that both of the artists presenting today were selected from uh, participants in our 2021 Medium Review, the Portfolio Review, um, and were nominated for the Second Sight Award. Uh, this award is given to one artist annually, um, and that artist presents a lecture at the 2022 Medium Festival. Um, and they also produce a limited edition fine print um, for our patron level and group of 16 members. Uh, quick final reminder uh, to keep your microphones muted during the presentation. Um, you're welcome to type questions or comments in the chat and we will address those after each of the uh, presentations. So, <clears throat> We'll begin today with the work of Krista Svalbonis, who's an artist based in Philadelphia. For the last decade, Krista's work has focused on an exploration of architecture and ideas of home drawn from her interest in architectural form and structure as it relates to human psychology. Her cultural background as an ethnically Latvian Lithuanian artist adds to this interest based on her parents who spent many years after World War II in German camps for displaced persons before they were ultimately allowed to emigrate to the United States. Krista's family connection to this history increased her awareness of the political impact on architecture as an art form, and in turn has given rise to this work, which explores architecture's relationship 
to cultural identity, social hierarchy, and psychological space. Uh, Krista was nominated for the Second Sight Award by Ann Kelly, Lisa Hostetler, Alex DaCosta, Ann Jastrab, and Rick Wester. And with that, uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn the stage over to Krista Salbonis. Cool, thank you so much, Scott. Really excited to be here and to um, share my work. So I'm gonna start my share screen. Fingers crossed, everything goes well. Oh, almost. Okay, um, am I good? Okay, all right. Good. So thanks, thanks. Um, so as uh, Scott mentioned, my work revolves around um, ideas of home, sense of place, um, migration and diaspora. And um, I have been working on a series that traces former displaced person camps that existed in Germany right after World War II. Um, and so the inhabitants of these camps were Baltic individuals, individuals that were coming from Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia um, that were fleeing Soviet occupation at the time. There are about um, 200 camps that were dedicated just to Baltic individuals um, at that time. And I've documented close to 50 of them for, for this series. The um, process of finding the camps was quite difficult. Um, there's no real database um, of addresses for these camps. Um, records for this time period in history is really, they're really scattered throughout the globe. Um, but one of the uh, best archives that I went to was in the UN, the UN archives here in New York, um, where I found a number of camp maps and plans. And you're seeing one here. This is for Neustadt that's in um, Northern Germany that was part of the UK zone. Many of the camps did not have street addresses or anything like that on them. So Google Earth, um, and I are BFFs. And so we were able to really find um, where the camps were located by kind of taking these maps and um, looking through Google Earth, checking the number of buildings, the placement of buildings. If there was a large um, you know, sports field like you're seeing here on the right, that that also existed in the camp plan. Um, and so that's where I found my initial steps as to where these camps were located. Um, and then traveling to Germany, I traveled with a series of um, photographs from that time period, also taken from various archives. And then I used those photographs to really make sure that I was in the right location, um, documenting the right buildings. I would do the same thing. I would look at the building structure, um, look at surrounding buildings, making sure things matched up. And then I was photographing the correct spaces. So also in that process of finding the locations, I came across a large number of plea letters that the refugees were sending to the governments of um, US, UK, and Canada, all asking for asylum. So you're seeing a um, example of one of those here. This one was sent to um, Eleanor Roosevelt. And they basically explained in various ways that uh, they could not return back home because they would be seen as enemies of the state. And so they had to find um, homes elsewhere. So I've been taking uh, the words from those letters and literally um, burning them through the process of laser cutting into my images of the refugee camps. And so you're seeing an example of one of those here. Um, there are two sort of iterations of what I've been doing with these images. There are uh, pieces like this that are stacked. Um, there are two photographs, actually one on top of the other laser cut to um, create this dimensional uh, look of the photograph. And then also um, singular images that are partially cut, uh, which very much look like the building is sort of disappearing or falling away, um, much like 
this history actually is. It's an install shot um, at Marshall Contemporary out in LA. And so these are um, pre uh, presented basically in plexiglass cases. I'm very much interested in the photo object. They're presented as such as objects that a viewer can kind of move around and see all angles of. Additionally, I've been traveling throughout North America, US um, and the United States with a bulk of that traveling actually happening this past summer. Um, and I've been finding individuals who are housed in these camps. I go to their home, um, I sit down, I take their portrait, and then I record their um, history of flight and migration. And uh, also as Scott mentioned, this series really began as a um, investigation into a personal family history. This is an image of my father. So both of my parents were in uh, these camps before they were allowed to emigrate to the US. And so that's where the whole process began, but of course became much, much larger um, than that in the end. I was able to start a new series recently this past year, which also um, traces this history, but in a little different format. Um, so these are images that I've been taking um, throughout the Baltics, primarily in Lithuania, of buildings that were built during Soviet occupation. Um, and I've been partnering these buildings with traditional textile patterns, also through a process of laser cutting. And the reason being is there was a very concerted effort during Soviet occupation to create this homogeneous one culture and to really eradicate any sense of individuality um, of these countries that the Soviet Union had usurped. And so keeping these traditions alive and continuing them was really seen as an act of political resistance. And this is a installation of the pieces. Uh, earlier this year, I was asked to activate uh, the window facade at the Print Center here in Philadelphia. Um, and so you'd have a very different experience um, depending on when you encountered the work. It was viewable 24 seven. So if you were there during the day versus the night, um, you would have a, a very different feeling uh, between the patterns and the buildings um, from them being illuminated or not illuminated. And I have a video that I just want to quickly share here. I'm just going to do a share like this. So um, it's a little behind the scenes here. Um, the cuts are very, very intricate. As you can see, they take a long time to create and to process. Um, but I am literally you know, cutting through the actual image. Um, and cutting away parts of the image for this process. And that actually concludes um, my presentation. Thanks for, for listening. That's great. Thanks, um, Krista. I was really struck by, you talk about your work in, in terms of architecture. Um, but I was really struck by how um, archaeology also seems to be um, like at, active in your work. And um, it's like you're excavating, especially the first project you mentioned, you're sort of virtually excavating these places in this memory. Um, and then uh, with the lace, you're kind of doing it as well, bringing to the fore these um, sort of unseen patterns um, that existed simultaneously. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit about, I know what you're interested in is sort of human memory and human response to these spaces and, and these memories. So if you could talk a little bit about how archeology span and architecture sort of work um, with in your practice. Yeah, I mean, I think that um, in a lot of ways, I, I talk about my practice being heavily like research based. There's a lot of research that goes in, and and that to me is archaeological in a lot of ways. You know, there's a lot of like peeling away layers, peeling away the history, 
um, revealing something that is not well known. This history is not well known. Um, individuals who actually are firsthand witnesses of this history are steadily disappearing. So, you know, you have that also, also happening. Um, so yeah, I mean, I wouldn't be like it. I, I don't know if I'd call myself an Indiana Jones or anything like that, but, um, <laughs> I definitely, um, enjoy that process of like discovery and revealing, um, a lot, you know, it was a massive rabbit hole to kind of, uh, find those places. Um, but every time I got closer to finding one, it was like, it was a massive success. It was almost as exciting as making the work itself. Um, so I, I really do consider that research part, um, integral to kind of the work that I make. And then architecture has sort of permeated, um, my thought process for a while, you know, having, grown up as a daughter of refugees and sort of figuring out, you know, um, also a daughter of immigrants kind of figuring out where my place is and what do I define as home, you know, um, in this strange, like hybrid world, one foot, you know, over in the, in the homeland. And then, you know, one foot here in, in the U S and growing up with cultural traditions that were continued on very, you know, actively, um, as a child. Um, so that whole thing has always kind of brought into question myself. How do I, how do I define home? How does that, how does a place factor into that? Um, how do places change the way we think about home, um, and the spaces we live in? So that kind of thing. And I think also you have, I mean, and I'm glad you brought up the idea of home because it also struck me that you have this sort of like large, almost objective, like you use the photograph to make this picture of this large, especially with the buildings and the lace, like very sort of um, cold and sterile um, mm -hmm. places. And then you infuse it with the, with this very like handmade lace and, and personal memories um, written in letters. Um, so do you, is that process of sort of in, intertwining um, uh, sort of very sterile with very homey? Um, uh, some is, it, is that where home is? Like, what what have you found in terms of like what home means based on all of the art that you've uh, been making? Um, I guess I mean what I've discovered personally is that it's malleable, you know, it changes, it grows it, um, with life experience. Right. So I think my parents, if you ask them what home is, and they're going to have a very different, um, answer for you than, than what I, what I do, but, um, or what I have, um, but through, I think through each body of work I make, like I get closer to answering that question for myself. Um, I don't know, if I know it just yet, <laughs> um, but I do know that is, you know, it has been a collection of um, family memory. It's been a collection of memory that that's been carried through to my family, carried through to where I am today. Um, and then carried through in the, in the work that I'm making by discovering that family history. Um, so that's as best as I can give you. <laughs> that no, no, that's, that's great. And it's probably changed during the pandemic as well. Um, yeah. Yeah. There was um, a, some comp, yeah, questions yeah, in the chat. I, I wanted to just touch on that. Um, there's a question that, that I had too, which is what exactly are you cutting? Because I've seen your work in person and I believe some of them are 3D printed materials that replicate the conception of photographs, but it seems like you're also, or maybe I have that wrong, you're, you're also physically cutting photographic prints through a laser cutter, but can you clarify that? Yeah, so um, no 3D representation, although that sounds really cool and I might wanna try that. <laughs> um, um, but uh, no, I, I take um, a print, I take a photographing print, um, it's on a very, very heavy kind of stock, and then I literally cut and burn, burn into the, into those. Um, yeah. So that's, that is, that's the process of kind of what I'm doing for, for all, for both, both series. And then there was also a question about, um, do you know if there, 
what the governmental mandates or guidelines were for the creation of these buildings in the first place, the high rises? Oh, um, no, I don't know what the mandates mandates were for the for the Soviet buildings, um, but they're created to house, you know, a large number of people um, it very cheaply and very quickly. So there, uh, that's what I can tell you about the origins of those spaces. Um, a lot of them, yes, were created with um, quickly with very cheap materials. So there's plumbing issues in those buildings and, and there's lots of things going on. Um, and there is a um, difficult relationship that those countries have with those, those structures still existing. Um, the people that remember that history um, have a hard time with those buildings. And then there are, you know, individuals who have never experienced Soviet occupation and they have a very different read of those buildings. So it's complicated. Great, thank you. Lisa, did you have any other uh, thoughts or questions you wanted to share? No, I, um, not right now, maybe. <laughs> Great. Um, so uh, there's one other comment here that just came in. Um, I'm just gonna read it. I like how the photos of the camp buildings look pixelated. You mentioned that the buildings look like they're disintegrating um, and that this also kind of lends a sense of, of memory or the idea that, um, that history is fragmentary, that it's kind of metaphor um, for the, the holes in our own memories and histories, which I think is really a beautiful, beautiful summary of it. That is, that is lovely. I'm gonna screen cap that <laughs> so I can keep that for future reference. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you very much, Krista. That was really fantastic um, to hear more about the work, to see it, um, to see a little behind the scenes. Uh, that was great, thank you. Awesome, thank you. You're welcome. Um, so our next uh, speaker, the second speaker for, this afternoon um, is um, Ann Vetter. Sorry, I'm doing a little bit behind the scenes here. Um, Ann is an artist based in the San Francisco Bay Area. Uh, she's a queer, trans, non-binary Jew. Her work is focused on the fluidity of identity while pushing up against how whiteness and wealth can both protect and inhibit a body. She graduated magna cum laude from Colby College in 2017 with theses in anthropology, art, and poetry. Um, her work is currently in an exhibition at the Huxley Parlor Gallery in London, um, which we will include uh, a link to as part of um, the chat, as well as a link to her um, website as well. Uh, and Anne was nominated for the Second Sight Award by Jacqueline Bates of California Sunday Magazine, Ali Hoisline at Pier 24, Adam Monahan, Mary Statzer, and Barbara Tenenbaum from the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, I will go ahead and stop my screen share now and turn it over to Anne Vetter. Welcome. Thank you so much. Um, I'm so, first of all, I'm just so excited to be here. And Krista, it was so wonderful to hear about your work and to hear about, you know, we make such different work and we work in such visually different ways, physically different ways, but to keep coming back to the same ideas of diaspora, um, of home, of what does it mean to belong? I, I'm not the child of immigrants, but I am the grandchild of immigrants. And so I related a lot to um, what you were speaking about. And so I'm excited to be sharing this space together. Um, and I'm also very excited to talk to you all today about my project, Love is Not the Last Room. So as Scott said, my name is Ann Fetter. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and also sometimes he, him. Um, and so, Love is Not the Last Room is at the most basic level, a project about my family. So my mom, my dad, my brother, Matt, my brother, Douglas, my partner, Dario, a whole slew of cousins. And then as you'll see, as the slideshow continues, my brother's friends have really started to infiltrate the project. Um, 
And I shoot in and around homes in Wellfleet, Massachusetts and Kentville, California. So the project really is about family, it's about home. And I began this project in the summer of 2019 because I really wanted to look, <coughs> excuse me, sorry. I wanted to look at my family. I wanted to look at what was closest to me. I think there's oftentimes a pressure um, as photographers to look beyond ourselves. And something that I'm very, have always been very interested in is how much more can you know about what has become mundane to you? And so when I left college, I actually moved back in with my parents and I haven't moved out. I'm really happy there. I love it, but it's my everyday life. I get to watch them. I get to watch them move the light. I get to watch my brothers move through the house when they come back to visit. And I realized that there really was something there. Maybe it was because I was looking at a lot of Joel Meyerowitz's work and he was shooting in the same part of Cape Cod as I was when I began this project. But I was like, yeah, project about family, project about life. Like, let's see how this goes. Um, and since the very beginning of this project, it has been such a collaboration. Um, this work doesn't exist without my parents and it doesn't exist without the rest of my family as well. There's so much sharing that goes on. Um, there's so much reaction. Um, I really think of it as like a dance, this kind of like, okay, like on Tuesday, I saw dad move to the kitchen at this time and the way that the light, he never wears a shirt. So the way that the light moved over his shoulder, what a beautiful thing. And then I'll take him back to that room and I'll photograph him there and he'll move it in a different way. And it's this constant back and forth. Um, and I think because of that, there's this level of intimacy that's in the work, this opting in from everyone who's involved, this buying in from everyone who's involved. And you get this really close look at people. But something that I really enjoy in my work is that no matter how close you get, I like, I like when people put up a guard a little bit. I know that in photography, you're supposed to render people a little bit vulnerable. But I really like to watch when people put up that guard. It's really interesting to watch people hide. Um, a lot of times I'm not thinking when I shoot. Like I said, it really is that improvisational reaction to the light. Um, and then sometimes the photos will just be, you know, the one on the right here is a self-portrait of me with my feet on the kitchen table. I can't say that it means much more than that to me, except that it's a moment of leisure, a moment of rest. I also really like touching my feet. My mom hates it when I put my feet on the kitchen table and she wasn't around so I could do it. But sometimes you end up with this photo like on the left and I look at this photo and I'm like, that, yeah, that photo is incredibly queer to me. There's something that is so queer to me about this photograph and it's this like weird zigzag intersection of light. And so sometimes these like simple photos take on very deep meaning and these very you know complex photos, they mean very little like, at all. Um, as I was talking about a little bit with the self-portrait with my feet on the table, leisure is a really big part of my work. I'm really drawn to still and slow moments, partially because it's the kind of art I like to look at. Um, my mom is a big 16th and 17th century Flemish painting fan. And so that was a lot of the art I grew up looking at, This these like slow, still portraits where everything feels so suspended. And I, I call myself a little bit of a lazy painter. When I photograph, I'm oftentimes leaning into these tableau moments that, that feel just serene and still and calm. Um, and I, it's not really a true reflection of how I am as a person or even how my life is, but I find myself returning again and again and again and again. Um, I think that any photographer of a marginalized identity can um, relate to the idea that our work is oftentimes put in boxes. And so I'm oftentimes, I mean, obviously my, my bio starts with Ann Vetter is a queer trans non-binary Jew, but I'm oftentimes used to being called, oh, Ann's a non-binary photographer, Ann's a queer photographer, Ann's a Jewish photographer. Um, and I'm expected in a way to explore those identities visually. And I'm expected in a way to explore those identities in a way that people who do not have those identities can read and interact with. Um, and sometimes I lean into that, like in a photo like this, where I get to use my body to play with how I express my sex and my gender. But 
oftentimes I'm much more interested in leaning away from that. And one of the ways I lean away from that is people seem to be really interested in what's going on with trans and non-binary bodies. Um, even one like me where I pass as cisgender, but no one really gives a shit at looking um, very deeply into cisgender men and looking into masculinity. And I'm really interested in taking a queer approach to looking at anyone's gender, not just my own. And that's a purposeful choice I make as an artist to not other myself, to not other my gender, to not treat my gender as any more extraordinary or any less mundane than anyone else's in my family. Um, and it's also a choice that's been made by my family to every day greet me as I am. And so I try to do the same with the people in my photographs. I try to meet everyone on the same even ground. Um, and so here you see two very different expressions of masculinity, one from my partner Dario on the left, the other from my little brother Douglas and my dad on the right, one that is more like stable, holding, still. And one like my family likes to wrestle. There's a lot of like touching and grabbing and like yanking around and, you know, like that kind of exertion that's going on. Um, and something I've become really interested in, in particular in the last year, is exploring my masculinity in relationship to my little brother, Douglas. So he's about four years younger than I am. And during the pandemic, he moved home from college and was living with my parents and me. And I think the exploration really came by at first proximity. He was just around. The house is different when there's a 21 year old cisgender boy hanging out in the house. Like the gender balance shifted away from being my cisgender woman, mom, my cisgender man, dad, and then whatever, like, gender queer fluid thing I am in the middle there was this like shift towards masculinity again in a way that there hadn't been since my brothers moved out so I was like let's see what happens I'm gonna roll that way a little bit and so I got to play and explore um and I ended up one of the photos I'm or this is a piece together that I'm really happy with this is a self-portrait as my brother Douglas um Douglas and I as you can see look fairly identical um we're pretty much the exact same height. We weigh the same amount. If I had a mustache or more of a mustache than I do, we would pretty much be twins. And it's really such a gift to have a sibling of a different gender who looks so similar because like I've said four times in this talk, I'm trans and non-binary, but I have no plans to transition hormonally or surgically. And there's a lot of reasons for that. Part of the reasons is in my photographs, I get to use Douglas as a stand-in for that masculinity that no one else can see but me. There are days I wake up and I look in the mirror and I see myself like Douglas. I look like Douglas, but no one else sees that. They don't really see that in me. And so in photographs, I can put him in my Magan David. I can put him in my Shoshana Hebrew necklace and he can be me. I can be him for a little while. And that's a very sweet Thing, and it's a gift he, he gives back to me um, and I'm lucky to take. And here's another photograph kind of in very similar light. I oftentimes find myself making these diptychs without even meaning to of me and Douglas. Um, my poor older brother, he's not even included. He doesn't, he lives in Texas. It's, it's not because I don't love him. It's because he lives far away. Um, but this is a new path and I'll go over this fairly quickly. Um, last year during the pandemic, there was a moment where my little brother was hanging out with some friends and everyone was tested. There was, this was like one weekend and I had been so sick of just photographing my parents, Douglas, myself, Dario. And Douglas was like, okay, Anne, I've got four friends. They're coming for the weekend. And I was like, yes, I've never wanted to photograph fraternity brothers before, but here we go. And what happened felt electric. I felt really electrified by being around this many cisgender guys who just wanted to touch each other and be close to each other and wrestle and who are so willing and eager to participate. And this summer when everyone was vaccinated, Douglas had some more friends come out and stay. And I started making more work with them. And I, you know, last winter I'd put together a book edit of Love is Not the Last Room. And those earlier photos, these photos made it in but then I put the edit aside and I started making more of these photos of Douglas and his friends. And 
I'm not really sure if they belong. I mean, to Douglas, they're his fraternity brothers. They are his family. Are they my family? What does that mean? Or is this a completely different project? Is this taking me somewhere new? Um, it's hard to say, but I will end with this last photograph of my, Doug of my brother Douglas. This is another self-portrait of Douglas. Um, and I think this really does point in the direction that my photography is going right now. Um, I don't expect Douglas to usurp me in my self-portraits, partially because that defeats my purpose of being a gender fluid person. I don't wanna give up this body. I don't wanna give up this form. I just wanna live in that form for a little while. Some of the time I wanna be able to have chest hair when I wear a dress. And so I'm excited to see how Douglas as me, maybe even me as Douglas begins to break apart, disrupt love is not the last room. And I don't know, I, I don't really know where it all goes, but I'm excited to share it here with you today. And thank you so much for listening. Let me get out of here. That was really great. Thank you so much, Anne. Thank you. <laughs> I really enjoyed um, feeling a great sense of, um, of humanity in your work and, and also the geographic connection to Joel Meyerowitz and honestly, a lot of other people who, who are, I don't know, there's, there's a great concentration of, of remarkable photographers in the Northeast in and around Boston, you know, the greater Cape Cod area. Um, and a lot of them are, are portrait or people photographers, maybe they're not portrait photographers as well. And I feel like there's a, there's a really nice connection to your work in a, in a much bigger sense, but I love how personal it is to you yeah. with this history of these growing up with Dutch masterwork paintings and other things. But I just wanted to kind of put that out there because it's been Thank you. brewing in my head. Thank you. Um, yeah, I also wanted to kind of, what struck me as you were talking was you talk about the fluidity of, of gender and you also talk about these, your close, your sort of intimates and familiars. And um, uh, it's, uh, I'm not sure how to phrase this as a question, but um, uh, it seems uh, that there is an echoing of fluid genders and also the fluidity of the family that you have, they're all inside you, they sort of infuse you as well. So uh, the, so you're part other people and part yourself and that makes you unique, unique. And, and I think that kind of intimacy really comes through in your photographs. Um, and I, um, that made me, so when you said that um, you like to watch people put up the guard um, and uh, to kind of take, um, to watch that process of hiding. And I wondered if, it, if, if what you thought about I, I wanted to hear more about that. Like, is is you like that um, because and and it also strikes me that everybody has like sort of multiple mm -hmm. personas that they play, especially in families. And so, is it about the sort of like the camera makes and forces them to pick one, um, yeah. and that's it, you know sort of not the it, but they aren't just the one. It's just it appears to be that way. I don't know if that's a question, but maybe you can speak to it. Yeah, I can definitely speak to that. I think one of the reasons why I love watching people hide is because it, it's people think that it's less vulnerable, but it is them actually showing you their vulnerability. It's like if if you're like coming up to someone and they flinch, that it's like a response. You're like, oh, like there's something in there. There's something that I can't know. There's something so deep down that like you don't even know that you're telling me. Um, I think that's part of it. I think it's also interesting to watch, you know, people are willing to show different parts themselves, myself, even like there's days I'll get in front of the camera and I'm like, God damn, I'm making the same photo face in every single photo. It's the same frozen, like, because I don't, I'm not willing to relax and relent to the process. Um, and that tells me a lot about where I am. And so I don't really see a separation between my photography and my life. And so the more willing people are to work with me, that tells me a lot about where they are. It's a way of communicating with them. It's a way of us speaking as a family without necessarily saying like, I don't feel whatever today. And I, there's something else I've said before, which is um, 
I think it's in my artist statement for this piece, which is about um, the limits of being able to know anyone, even those who are closest to you. I live with my parents 24 seven. Like I am up in their lives. Like I am just hanging out with them all the time. And I don't know most of them. They don't know most of me. And that's not for lack of trying. It's just the very nature of it. And I think also um, as you know, people expect like, oh, you're of this marginalized identity. You must understand all people of this marginalized identity as well. Like all Jews know each other, all queers understand each other, you know, whatever, all people speak to the same language. And it's just, it's not true. Even if I were to find another half Guisha, half Sephardic Ashkenazi, like upper middle class, white, like queer, non-binary Jewess, like we would probably not understand each other at all. Like we could literally be from the same neighborhood and be so different. Well, I think you're right. That's the nature of humanity. Like we, we can't know each other yeah. um, exactly, but there's, it's rewarding to try or there's meaning exactly. and significance in trying to reach across that sort of, some, that divide of subjectivity. Absolutely. Um, um, and then I was also struck by um, the your comment about how um, the, the your work is sort of offered as like making um, queer bodies palatable to people who um, have normal whatever that is um, a relationship to their um, gender and um, I'm. I'm curious about that because what I hmm, I think that they're they're how does that work like and what why you know I think that they're just beautiful photographs and and really speak to human intimacy and family and um and human uh, relationships and um so uh. I think they just are palatable for anybody. Um, I think it's less about yeah. what I was not saying was about them being palatable as much as like, I think it was between palatability and legibility. And something I'm, I'm uh, oftentimes told is that my work isn't about queerness because I don't look queer enough or my body doesn't look trans enough or my relationship doesn't look gay enough um, or work about family can never be queer, which I think just T. Dugan disproved like forever ago. Yeah. Like, like it, but all these things of like queerness is like, I always joke, I'm like, my work would be gay if I photographed myself like in a strap on. Like, that's what people are wanting. And that's what I really mean by legibility. If people want a sign and a symbol that they can really gleam onto, and queer people as a form of psychic and material survival in a culture that is continually erasing us have had to bind ourselves to these very set symbols, partially as a way of flagging to each other, but also partially as a way of just like not getting washed away by heteronormativity, but then we're expected by that heteronormative gaze to hold on to them to flag them be like if work is about queer queerness it has to have this this and this I mean I've been told multiple times that my work would be more significant if I had a cisgender woman partner I've been told many more times that my work would be more significant if I were to want to transition hormonally or surgically and it's just like what is so wrong about a queerness that looks the way that it is I think none of this is to set aside like there is so much importance and so much necessity for queer work that is visible in different ways. Like I know that there is a level of safety to the way that I am queer in the world that most queer people will never have access to because of, you know, just how visibility is danger. And so none of that, none of this is to be like, visibility is bad, but to say that like queerness is unbounded and undefinable and it cannot be pinned down to any one body, any one relationship, any one moment. It doesn't belong to anyone, it belongs to everyone. That's my rant. <laughs> no, I think I think that's a great point too because it's like it's sort of like the world asking for the box to be advertised or broadcast, and yeah. when it's more subtle or nuanced, which that's how reality is, is subtle and nuanced, and it's never all clearly black white or one thing or another. Um, it's limiting in a way, and your and what your work is really about is what if there weren't limits 
exactly. And, and exactly. It, you know, so. yeah, exactly. Thank I think you. it's um, it's I'd really like fascinating. To, I'd like to add on to that um, what you've both been talking about because, and I really feel a great sense of appreciation for how your work has really complicated the the these ideas that we might hold about gender norms, about queer norms, about any number of the things that, that you've been talking about. Um, it's really, it's, it's a service um, in a lot of ways. And I don't mean to reduce it to that. I mean that as a, as a huge compliment, that it's an education, you know, that, that the world of queer people, non-binary people, et cetera, looks like this and it looks like this and it looks like that. And it's, you know, it's helpful. This is, this is what we are all learning and paying attention to as part of the human experience. Um, and the other thing I was thinking about is, I'm curious if you might speak to, you talked about fluidity in two different spaces, mm -hmm. one being gender um, and the other being your family, that you have this kind of fluidity that, that you know, photography is life and life is photography. And I thought that that was really beautiful how seamless that all is and how it comes together and comes through in the work um, just in your presentation of it. And I'm curious if you could speak to that a little bit. Yeah, I think part of it is, is I'm really, I mean, like something I'm continually working on in my family. My mom is on this call with my dad right now um, and they'll probably laugh. Like I'm not great with boundaries. I'm not great with, I'm actually really bad with limits in a way that is both a curse and also really lovely where um, when I have a project, it takes over the house. And so it's easier just to make the house the project. Um, it's easier just to work that way. I mean, as a child, I was constantly like painting the walls. And so I feel like this is a much kinder version of that to my parents. Um, but I think that a lot of artists see that kind of slippage between like, what is personal life? What is professional life? Like there's so many artists who work in that middle ground where, um, yeah, like, relationship feeds on to work and for me it's always about how do you keep them contained but all like together but also separate so that you're not doing things like I'm not when I'm spending time with my parents just thinking about photographs I'm realizing that the work is to be intimate and present and alone with my parents and sometimes not have my camera there that there is no work if the work is there all the time um that if I'm constantly looking at how like my partner looks in the light, then I'm not going to have a relationship anymore. There is no art without the relationship, but there is a relationship without the art. That's yeah, very well said. Thank you. Um, Lisa, do you have any other thoughts or questions that you wanted to add? Uh, no. Okay. I think. Uh... If are there any other questions in the chat, I haven't really been looking. I don't see any in the chat. Um, both Kevin and I have been paying attention to that. Um, yeah, I just want to make sure that. that... Well, I guess I do have one. I'm, you know, we heard um, Anne talk about um, her um, response to Krista's work, and I'm wondering if mm -hmm. Krista wants to respond to Anne's work in any way without putting you on the spot. You could say no. <laughs> oh, you just put me in the hot seat there, Lisa. <laughs> now I feel like I need to come up with something like a brilliant to blow on everyone's mind. <laughs> um, um, I think, I guess one thing that is interesting, um, and you're talking about relationships with our work. And then I hinted on this idea of like how for me home and also sort of myself in relationship to my parents and my own history, how that mutates and changes and develops and is also fluid in a way, um, depending on that relationship. So I, that's uh, an interesting connection between um, what we're both making, that it's all a process of self-discovery, but in two different ways um, and, and with sort of different historical boundaries um, and personal boundaries. So I think it's also unfair because I didn't talk about the thing that really relates our work together, which is like as a Jew being of the diaspora, like the word diaspora is like so deeply ingrained in my body and in my experience. So a lot of the like feelings of displacement, feelings of like displaced home that I would have been easier. I was, I was connecting from a place of knowing all this and you had to go a little blind, but really I just, 
I loved hearing about your work so much. And it was such an honor to talk with you tonight. Oh, that's really, I loved hearing about your work too. And it's, um, the relationship of form and light is just stunning in your pieces. And so, um, it was a pleasure too. Thanks. Yeah. It's, it's one of the beautiful things about taking two artists who didn't ask to be together. It's kind of like a <laughs> position of sorts, a very small one. Um, but, uh, but, you know, bringing them together and encouraging us to think about, you know, the notions of how we relate to domestic spaces, how we relate to family histories. And it's really nice to see these kind of confluences um, between the two of your work, um, knowing that they're unrelated um, in a lot of ways. But, um, well, I want to thank you both uh, for presenting your work and being part of this uh, Second Sight conversation today. And I want to thank Lisa Hostetler for being a great um, host as well, and Kevin Miller for um, helping us behind the scenes. Uh, I'm looking forward to the third and final Second Sight conversation that we have scheduled for October 7th. Uh, that's at the same time, which is 4 o'clock p.m. on the West Coast, 7 o'clock p.m. Um, on the East Coast, this one will be with Eric Kunzman, um, Kathleen Robbins, and moderated by Adam Monahan, who's an independent curator based out of Tucson, Arizona. So I hope that you will join us for that. And I want to thank everybody for joining us uh, for this today. It's been absolutely wonderful. And I want to uh, wish you all a good night as well. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Sure.